Let's take a look at rotational kinematics. Earlier in the course, we studied linear kinematics. And there were three basic quantities that kind of kept track of the motion of objects. One of them kept track of where the object is, how far it is away, and in what direction. And that was the displacement. A second quantity kind of tracked how fast that object was moving. And that was called the velocity. And it was equal to the rate of change of displacement. And then there was a third quantity that kept track of how fast the speed was changing. And that was called the acceleration. And that would equal the rate of change of velocity. Now, similarly, we're going to need three quantities to keep track of rotational motion. So let's suppose this rod rotates. First thing we're going to want to keep track of is how far it rotates. And we could do that very simply using this angle here. And that angle, theta, is called the angular displacement. We could use degrees to measure that angle theta. Turns out it's more natural and easier if we use radians to measure that angle theta. Secondly, we'd like to know how fast is our object rotating. And we keep track of that using a quantity omega, which is called the angular velocity. It's really the same omega that we used in simple harmonic motion, where we called it the angular frequency. It's really one and the same. And it's going to be equal to the rate of change of angular displacement. Its units are going to be radians per second. And then we're going to need a third quantity that's going to keep track of how fast is that rotational rate changing. And we're going to use an alpha to represent that. It's going to be called the angular acceleration. And it's going to be equal to the rate of change of the angular velocity. And its units are going to be radians per second every second. Or we could just say radians per second squared. So you can see there's a direct parallel between linear motion and rotational motion. And in fact, mathematically, they're really identical. Now we're going to be using radians a lot, so let's very briefly review what a radian is. So let's say I've got a circle here, and I've got an angle in that circle. I'm going to try to draw that angle such that that angle is one radian. Now, it's only going to truly be one radian if this length here, that arc length, is exactly the same size as the radius. And what that implies is that if you have an angle that goes all the way around the circle, then that angle is going to be 2 pi radians, simply because there's 2 pi radii in the circumference of a circle. And I think it's helpful to visualize this. This arc length here is one radius. So there's one radian. There's two radians. There's approximately three radians. Four radians. Five radians. And six radians. Six radians and a little bit here. Well, 2 pi is what? 6.28? So you can fit just over six radii into the circumference of a circle. So once around the circle is 6.28 radians. Now if we take these angular displacements theta and we put them into radians, we get some really simple relationships. And that's why we like to use radians. So in the cases of rolling and pulleys, we'll see there's a really simple relationship between these linear quantities and these angular quantities. So let's say we've got a ball rolling on a surface here. And it rolls through an angle of theta here. The radius of the ball will be r. Then, of course, this arc length here, by the definition of the radian, will be given by theta times r. And similarly for the pulley, let's say it rotates here through an angle theta. Radius is r then this arc length would be given by theta r. Now, of course, if 
this distance is theta r, then the distance that the ball is going to move forward by, x has to be the same. It has to be theta r as well. If this distance here is one meter, the ball moves forward by one meter. Same thing here. If this is one meter, then this weight would drop down by that same distance of one meter. So in both cases, we get that that linear displacement is equal to theta times r. So let's write that down. x equals theta times r. And this equation, of course, is going to apply if we made a very small angle here. Let's, call it, let's make it infinitesimally small. We could say that the delta x would be equal to delta theta times r. In other words, we can put small angles in there. And we can divide both sides by the amount of time it took to do that displacement. This here is just the change in displacement over time. It's the linear velocity. And this is the change in angular displacement per unit time. That's the angular velocity. So we end up with a second relationship. And of course, this relationship applies to very small increments as well. So we could write that the change in velocity would be equal to the change in angular velocity times the radius. And do the same trick again, divide by the amount of time it took for that change in velocity to occur. Now, of course, change in velocity over time, that's just the acceleration. Change in angular velocity over time is the angular acceleration. And the radius is a constant. So we've got these three relationships. x equals theta r, v equals omega r, and a equals alpha r, which can be summarized as saying that the linear quantity is equal to the angular quantity times r. So it's easy to remember. Now I've got a few examples to help you to become a little more familiar with using these rotational quantities. So here's a question from Giancali. Pause the video, try it out for yourself, come back for the answer. Okay, I've drawn the basic quantities. Here's our beam. You can see that it's spreading out. Now, what we're actually asked for in the question is this distance here. But by and large, being as this is a very small angle, that's exactly the same as the arc length. And we know the arc length is given by the angle in radians times the length of the radius. So we can multiply and work that out. The angle is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 radians. And we're going to multiply that by the radius, which is 380,000 kilometers. And if you want, that would be per radius. And in effect, these these units of radians and radius are going to cancel each other out. So you'll get an answer in kilometers, which is what you want, of course. And I think if you work that out, you're going to get 6.5 kilometers. So our beam is going to cover 6.5 kilometers on the surface of the moon. Here's another example. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So in part A, we've got this object executing circular motion with a radius of 50 meters. Um, we know the, uh, the object has a speed here of 10 meters per second. So as a little trick, what we can do is imagine one second. So in one second, if something's going at 10 meters every second, it should move here a distance of 10 meters. And then the angle here, by the definition of the radian, would be how many radii fit into that arc length. In other words, it's 10 meters divided by 50 meters, which is going to be 0 0.2 radians by the definition of the radian. But remember, that occurred in one second. So omega would be the equal to the number of radians in one second. So our angular velocity has to be 0 0.2 radians per second. Now, some of you might have done that a different way, because we were just talking about how the linear 
velocity is equal to the angular velocity times the radius for the cases of rolling and pulleys. So if I rearrange that, I'd get omega equals v over r, and v is 10 meters per second. r is 50 meters. So we get an answer there of 0 0.2. That would be radians every second. So even though we've got a particle moving around in a circle rather than a rolling object, we could imagine a little dot on the edge of our rolling wheel. And of course, if that little dot is moving at 10 meters per second, our wheel would move forward at 10 meters per second. So it's really the same relationship here. Now in part b, we're really just doing a unit conversion. We've got that 0 0.2 radians per second is the angular speed. But we want to convert that to revolutions per second. So I'd like to get rid of the radians and switch to revolutions. Just make the numerator equal to the denominator. And I know that one revolution is equal to 2 pi radians. And that's going to give me the number of revolutions every second. If I then multiply that by the number of seconds, which is 30 seconds, I get my result. And I think it's 0 0.96 revolutions. What I'd like you to do now is to indulge me for a minute. This is an old kinematics problem. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. There's different ways of doing this problem. I realized that time was not involved in this particular problem, so I could use the no time equation, which was that v squared equals u squared plus 2as, where s is the displacement. And I'm using the standard IB variables in this equation. So now I can plug in everything I know. I have an initial speed of 20 meters per second. My acceleration is downwards at 10, and my displacement is 5. If I work that out, I get that V should be equal to 14.4 meters per second. There's two answers because it could be going upwards at 14.4 or be coming downwards at 14.4. Okay, so be it. Now what we're going to do is a parallel problem, but this time it's going to involve uniform angular acceleration. And I think you're going to see, if you were good at solving those kinematic equations, you're going to be just as good at solving these rotational equations. So I've written down our kinematic equations when we have uniform acceleration. What I'm now going to do is transform them into the rotational equations when we have uniform angular acceleration. And all I need to do there is wherever I see a displacement, I'm going to change it to an angular displacement. Whenever I see a velocity, I would change that to an angular velocity. And we would have a final angular velocity to go with the final angular speed and a initial angular velocity as well. And whenever we see an acceleration, we're going to transform it into an angular acceleration. So mathematically, uniform acceleration and uniform angular acceleration are identical. The only difference is in the physical quantities themselves. So I'm going to write down the transformed first equation. Then I'd like you to pause the video and try to write down the rest of the equations and then come back for the answers. So our first equation would be that the angular displacement is equal to that initial angular speed times t plus one half angular acceleration times t squared. So pause the video, try it, come back for the answer. Okay, there they are. Check if your answers are correct. So here's an example of a uniform angular acceleration problem. What I'd like you to do is to see if you can work it out by choosing the appropriate rotational kinematic equation. So pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. Hopefully you realize this particular problem didn't involve time, so we could use the corresponding no time equation, which would be that final angular velocity squared 
would equal the initial angular velocity squared plus 2 times the angular acceleration times the angular displacement. So now we can put our values in. Our initial angular velocity was 20. Our angular acceleration is going to be negative because the object's slowing down at negative 10. And our angular displacement is going to be 5 radians. So I think you can see that mathematically this is identical to the linear problem that we did earlier. And so the final angular velocity is going to be 14.4 radians per second. And in this particular case, the negative 14.4 radian per second solution is not physical. And the reason for that is that friction is going to bring our rotation to a stop. It's not going to bring it to a stop and then speed it up in the opposite direction again. But hopefully you can see this direct parallel between the linear kinematic equations and the rotational kinematic equations. If you know how to do one, you know how to do the other just as well. So in the same way that we can do graphs against time of displacement, velocity, and acceleration, we can do graphs against time of angular displacement, angular velocity, and angular acceleration against time. So in that last example, we had a constant rate of angular acceleration. And that rate was negative 10. So it was losing 10 radians per second of angular velocity every second. It started with an initial angular velocity of 20. And then one second later, it would have dropped down to 10. And then the rotation would have stopped after two seconds. So this is zero seconds, one second, two seconds. And we get a linear drop in that angular velocity. In terms of the angular displacement, well, the area under this curve is a half base times height, which comes out to be 20 radians. And that means after two seconds, the object will have rotated through 20 radians. And once again, you're going to get that parabolic shape. Steep slope in the beginning, because it's rotating quickly. A slope near zero near the end here, because it's rotating very, very slowly until it comes to a stop. So that's what the rotational kinematics graphs would look like. So the big idea of the video was that earlier in the course we studied linear kinematics and we had a bunch of equations that described motion when we had constant acceleration. We're now studying rotational kinematics but we really don't need to invent any new equations. All we have to do is transform the equations. So instead of writing displacement, we're going to write angular displacement. And instead of writing velocity, we'll write angular velocity. And whenever we see an acceleration, we're going to write the corresponding angular acceleration. So if you understood linear kinematics well, you should be equally good at rotational kinematics. There's really nothing new there. We also learned that there was a relationship between these linear quantities and their angular counterparts. That was simply that the linear quantity would equal r times the angular quantity. Linear quantity equals r times angular quantity. Linear quantity equals r times angular quantity. And this became particularly applicable to the case of rolling objects and weights that were pulling pulleys. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.